That's why it's so important to not be home alone practicing in the shed all the time. Right. You need to interact because that devel develops another sensibility of your playing. It's such an important part of it. And if you underdevelop that muscle, you're going to struggle when you get out and play with musicians. Welcome back to Drummer's High. We're here with a good friend of mine, a friend I've known for quite some time, and, and uh, actually he's known the family for quite some time, Virgil Donati. Virgil, welcome to Drummer's High. Great to be here, Andy. <laughs> so we were talking a little bit early on, or earlier, about um, your father was a piano player, keyboard player. Yes. And he wanted you to learn how to play piano, but he would allow you to play drums too. Well, we're talking about very early on. I was th not even three years old at the time. Oh, oh okay, okay. I started playing drums. Yeah. They bought, you know, I had a passion for drums. Mm -hmm. He would rehearse, he, he and mum, mum was a singer, they would rehearse in the, in the house yeah. with their band and I'd always want to be present. Mm. Uh, and I would tap along and they noticed I had this empathy for rhythm. Mm. So my uncle, who was the drummer in the band at the time, <laughs> yeah. He persuaded them to buy a drum set for Good. me, which they did, and it all started from there. Mm -hmm. But my dad jokingly said when he saw that I was really passionate about drums, mm. that, okay, you can mess around on the drums for a while, but you're going to be a piano player. And that's when the reality hit, and I just broke down in tears, you know, little three, four-year-old kid. <laughs> At that age, you knew, well, piano's nice, but I want to be a drummer. I, well, I, I wanted to, I was more interested. When he said to me the words, mess around for now, but mm. you're going to be a piano player, I realized, okay, he was, he was placing barriers on my drumming. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this has got to stop. A, a crying fit. Mm -hmm. And we reached a compromise. So uh, he started taking me to piano lessons and drumming lessons when I was six years old. So. so we, we found in, in talking with all of the drummers that we know, one of the things that is, is uh, prevalent in almost everybody is, don't tell me what I can and can't do. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a good drummer attitude. I always love that part of it. I'm going to do it. And don't tell me I can't. <laughs> so really, that, that moment of passion was that young. Well, I guess it was, yes. That's I, amazing. I, That's, I, it's great, though. It gave you a chance to be able to, throughout your whole life, be thinking of things in a drumming perspective as compared to just wishing that you could. Well, exactly. I, I never had to think about what I was going to do in life. Yeah. You know, I just grew up knowing that this is what I was interested in and this is the path I would take, music. And there's, there's stories of, of, of from, from everybody, including I think from you when you were talking years ago about how when you were young you used to shed all the time. I, yes, I, I was pretty conscientious. Yeah. You know, I, I, I always felt the need this need to enhance myself, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to, to, to be better mm. at what I did. You know, even from that young age, you know, at school, I had the opportunities to get out and play mm -hmm. in the early days with my dad and then also started playing with other various artists or bands, even from a very young age. So I started really honing my skills from, from early on mm. and... Um, yeah, it, that just gave me the incentive and the drive to to want to be better all the time. And that curiosity. Yeah. 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 So now, even when you were younger, because you were saying that your dad used to say, I'm booking you for the gig tonight, you're playing, right? 
Then, so you played with with bands through your whole life. Yeah, pretty you know? much. So now I I've never heard anybody talk to me about this happening with their their family. But there's there's the 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 idea of the drummer's high is when you're playing and you're feeling great, everything's working right, and the bands come together and everything is real tight, the audience energy is rolling back, and all of a sudden, you're in a different zone. Now, I know that's happened to you. Did it happen with your dad, when you were playing with your dad? I... Because you could be pretty conscientious about, I'm playing with my dad. You could be, but let me, let me just say one thing first is that those moments are few and far between, mm. mm-hmm. in all honesty. Yeah. You, you don't get, well, I don't. Mm. I can only speak on behalf of myself. I don't get on stage every night and know that I'm going to reach that pinnacle, that moment of rapture. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's quite a rare thing mm. because have you heard, I guess you've, I'm sure you've heard the myth of in order to be a, gr- a good artist, mm. you need to suffer. Uh, well, it seems that that's yeah. such a big part mm. <laughs> of the project. <laughs> um, and I'd probably add to that, that in order to be a great artist, you need to suffer even more. So you're always fighting within yourself, you know, the frustrations. Okay. You, you know, we yep. hear about the frustrations of all artists, mm. you know, writer's block, or yep. et cetera. And I think frustration is part of that process. Mm. So when you're talking about struggle, you're not talking about how you're going to pay the rent, how, how you have to make things harder on yourself so that you can feel the life pain. You're talking about inner, inner struggle. How do I improve this? Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a good distinction. Yeah, that makes a lot Although of sense. Although the former also comes into play well, as an artist. <laughs> it can. <laughs> I mean, there's some people who have done well in life. And, and never had to have that real deep hardship, yeah. who have still turned into great musicians. Of course. But a different flavor, I guess, yeah. would be the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know um, uh, Miles Davis, of course, and, and uh, he had a um, uh, manager who was uh, Helen Keane. And Helen and I were talking about the Young Lions back in the, um, in the early 90s and jazz groups coming out. And I was saying, these people are great. And she said, yes, but listen to them. They don't have, uh, they don't have the pain. I said, what are you talking about? And she said, they haven't earned a sound yet. They can play every note, but they don't have the sound yet. And that's what you're talking about. Well, yes. And, but the great thing is that they will, they will earn that. Yeah, yeah. The, the truly great players. Mm. And nowadays, there are some very gifted young players out there. Oh, yeah. Some very able young players out there, if mm. not gifted. And, yeah, it's all a part of the, the, the development, the evolution of the artist. And, mm. A little more pain, a little bit, a little more life, and that, they will they will get there. They'll they'll reach those other yeah creates their voice points of hot yeah yeah yeah. Drummers, I love drummers. We're all different. We're all great. And one of the things that always gets me is the superstitions that everybody has. And like before you go out to play, some people have to, this is the drum pad I practice on before I play. Uh-huh. And other people, I have to be wearing these socks or I'm not going to play well tonight. Do you have any strange rituals or superstitions or anything that you do before playing? Oh, no, I don't actually. I'm really not a superstitious person. Wow. But you're the one. I do have, <laughs> I do have rituals though. Ah. And my ritual is not to have a practice pad instead to utilize whatever is available backsta- backstage usually uh, uh, either a, a chair mm-hmm. a couch or a table um, a chair is good leather or vinyl is best mm. gives you a nice soft rebound mm-hmm. and a uh, good sound actually and um, I don't have to carry any uh, too many miscellaneous items around with me, uh, as I already have so many, Mm -hmm. you know. uh, uh, And, you know, look, if I'm doing a long tour, I will bring a little warm-up set backstage. Oh, like a complete... No, well, no, just a set of pedals, which, again, I'll rest against a a sofa or something. 
just as long as I can uh, warm up the feet a little and uh, perhaps uh, just a small practice pad, yeah. So you got some furniture manufacturers out there who are loving what you're talking about. Oh, they're loving it. They're <laughs> Ooh, loving replacement it. couches. <laughs> yeah, so, I always leave a few dings in there. <laughs> so your, your, your musical voice is yours. Mm -hmm. It's unique. And as you play, and, and you, you, the people that you play with, you hear them playing with other drummers, but your voice, how do you think that that informs the band? How, do, how does your voice change the way they play? Um, do, you, do you find that, that you are, are hearing them playing with one drummer this way, and with you, it's a completely different thing? Well, you know, such a big part of music is, yeah. is the interaction right. with other musicians. Mm. That's why it's so important to not be home alone practicing in the shed all the time. Right. You need to interact because that develop, develops another sensibility of your playing. Mm. It's such an important part of it. And if you underdevelop that muscle, you're going to struggle when you get out and play with musicians. Yeah. So that balance between practice alone mm -hmm. and practice jamming, call it what you like, with other musicians or another musician, even one other musician, if you have a, a friend who's a bass player or a guitar player or whatever, keyboard player, you know, try and get together and learn and, and play together because that interaction is, is so important. And that's what's happening on stage is mm. that I believe the interaction with certain musicians, and I can only speak on how I interact or feel when I'm playing with them. Mm. I don't know how they're feeling with me, mm -hmm. but... I know that as we play more together in my bands, in my solo bands, for mm -hmm. example, there's, there's a, a clearer understanding and I can feel that with every tour, with every gig, mm. there's this synergy that, that improves. Yeah. So there is, there is that, that, that um, time of really understanding and learning how we interpret mm. music and the rhythms. But... Um, I think I've strayed away from the point I originally <laughs> wanted to make, but you know that's the general idea. I think that interaction is very important. Well, that, with the synergy that you're talking about that you have with with other musicians, that along with uh, well, the, the the attitude of drummers, don't tell me what I can and can't do, and and I'm you're going to think creatively and think beyond there. How does all of that inform the rest of your life, your non-playing portion of your life? It, it all has to have some type of influence with, with you. You, know, you. You get your energy out, but then you get energy back. Oh, yes. Mm. And that's, that, that's a very important point. You're putting out a lot, mm. but it's feeding you in, it's feeding you in return, that mm. creative energy. That's what strives you to keep going every day. Well, are you finding that in day-to-day -day life as well? I mean, non-musically, day-to-day? Oh, yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, mm. because it is the music and it's my life, it's my passion that informs the rest of my life, right. as you said. Yeah. I'm always, even subliminally, thinking or living in a way that is going to enhance what I do mm. when I get to my studio, when I'm playing, when I'm practicing or when I'm, yeah, when I'm playing out mm -hmm. live. Every, everything I do, I've always done. I've been fairly disciplined that way. Mm. I've done in a way that will enhance my passion in life. Mm. Well, it's obvious that you've been a disciplined person because you never could have gotten to the position where you are with your abilities without having that discipline and the curiosity. Yeah. And, and that, when in your, your personal relationships, do you find yourself with the discipline but at the same time the curiosity expanding your view of the world, your, your place in it? Well, I like to listen to others. Mm. I think it's so important to experience other people's lives yeah. in order to learn from that yourself and, mm. and, and maybe try and figure out, okay, what am I not doing right? Mm -hmm. what, what changes do I need to make? And, and we're, I, I don't think we've ever lived in a better time to realize that potential mm. because we have so many resources at our you know, immediate disposal now. Uh, and one great example of that is 
the new uh, journalistic culture of podcasts. Right. Which mm -hmm. is just such a wonderful learning tool. Mm -hmm. I listen to all these interesting people talking like we are yeah. right now about their lives and their passions and and it just gives you so many different perspectives and I find that's where I'm learning right now. Yeah. I'm learning, wow, I didn't think of it quite in those terms or, yeah, it just gives you a, a deeper dim dimension of life. Yeah, part of being a musician is the curiosity and the ability to take risks and, and um, hearing other people's perspectives and being able to not only hear it but understand it or try to appreciate it. That's, is, yeah. is that where you're, what you're talking about? Exactly. And, yeah. uh, you know, for example, I've always been inter interested in literature and reading and, right. you know, how much you can learn from that. But I've had very limited time to do it. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, podcast is a great way to do that mm. because I can get in the car and just, it means I have to forsake listening to some music, but I do enough of that in my life as it is anyway. <laughs> but it's... Um, yeah, like I said, it's just it's just remarkable how many amazing, creative, entrepreneurial people there are out there, and and and, and what's going on mm. day to day in the world. It's it's remarkable. Yeah, it's remarkable. You know, it just gives you faith in in human nature. In I human agree with beings. that. You're right. Even though there is so much, you know, well, turmoil. There's this and, much negative. Yeah, and, and that's this much positive. We still talk about this. Of course we yeah. do. Yeah. Which is unfortunate, but there it is. Now thinking of, of your, your kit and the way you approach your, your kit, your, your symbols, your sticks, when we make a symbol, we're 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 putting our energy into it. And to me, that's a it's its own living entity. Do you think of the kit as as just a, a toolkit, something that, that yes, it, it, it vibrates and it gives back, or is it almost like a partner in your playing? Do you, do you think that there's energy in it coming back to you from its own, I guess, soul? Well, yes, my drums have a soul. Yeah. <laughs> An inanimate soul, but nevertheless, mm. it's up to you to coax the voice of that soul out in right. the open. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? I mean, it's really, it's really the, the artist, you know, who, who is going to make that instrument speak, mm -hmm. you know. And that's what we're striving for. That's why I want to keep improving. Even at this age, at this point of my career, mm. um, I still haven't lost the drive and the passion. Good. And, and while I feel that, every day is going to be another step closer to where... I will never get. So now, with the, the energy that you put in, it's going to be different from the energy that somebody else puts in and, and gets back out of the kit. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why, why drummers never really have an issue with meeting and talking with other drummers. It's one of my favorite parts of being a drummer, is that when you see another one, you talk, say hello, give the drummer a hug, and, and it's always a very open and friendly relationship. There's always a lot of sharing. We don't seem to see that very often with other people in the band, do we? Um, Not the same way, anyway. Yeah, I. There is a special drumming fraternity. Yeah. Uh, there, there is a lot of communication, you mm. know. Um, but you can always. There's always an. Un, I can also sense an underlying competitive nature, which is a normal human in instinct. Sure. We can't. We can't ignore that. Mm -hmm. And I think anyone who doesn't believe that is lying to themselves. You know, drummers are competitive, probably more than anyone, because it's such a physical instrument. Right. And that physicality can be looked at as almost athletic in nature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being an athlete is very competitive. Right. So we have an element of that in our form of art. So I, in, in speaking with, with players and, and trying to figure out what it is, we, we sort of came up with the concept that even though I would play exactly the same lick that you're playing, because my tendons are different than yours, the length of my arm is different, the way that I'm moving is different, it won't come out the same. Close, but not the same, which is why 
I, I, my perspective is why drummers will be competitive, but not, um, but not shy with sharing and not, no. not afraid of being uh, open and, and, and uh, allowing people to, to see how you're doing what you're doing. But, it, but it's, a, it's a healthy competitive. Sure. It's not a destructive competitiveness. Mm. And, and quite often, that competitive is also turned inwards on yourself. It's like mm. you, know, you wanting to be better yourself. It's part of that whole you know, discussion. Yep. But I, you know, I've got to say that playing with all my uh, younger bandmates, you know, there's a new, there's a new, I think, culture out there now. I see the guitar players hanging out a lot together, coming to the gigs. Oh, and, that's good. Yeah, for yeah. example, my, my current guitar player in, in my solo band, Andre yeah. Nieri, great yeah. Brazilian guitar player, recently moved here to the US. And, yeah. He's always hanging out with his guitar bros, you know. He's hanging out with uh, uh, Pliny and uh, uh, Tosin, and, mm -hmm. and they're all getting on great, you know, and uh, inv inviting each other to gigs and, you know, hanging out after the gigs. And uh, so I see it happening, and even the bass players, yep. you know, even the bass well, players. Bass players have to hang out. Who's, who's, who's going <laughs> to hang out with yeah. them? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I think uh, I think it's spreading. Good, and that's a good thing. Oh yeah, and actually, you know, now that you mention it, I am seeing it more and more in this the generation uh, of twenty year olds right now. My kids are both in their twenties, and a completely different way of looking at life yeah. than even we did twenty yeah. years before that. Yeah, mm. and we we you know we we got to hand it over to them, man. That's, oh yeah, <laughs> that's that's the future, you know. <laughs> All right, it's time for oh the fast five. You ready? Oh, the fast five. The fast how five. quickly do I have to answer these? Oh, no. well, how, how, how you, concisely? You know what? As disciplined as you are, you don't need to be disciplined on this. Okay. <laughs> Free, right. form. Free, Free form. Free form. Non-drumming, who are your top three heroes? Oh, I've got so many heroes, but I'd have to categorize them. Sure. Let's go for literary heroes. Ah, good. I like literature. Yep. And just off the top of my head, there is just too many to choose from, but I'd say Ralph Waldo Emerson. Okay. Yep. Herman Hess. Mm, okay. And maybe a more contemporary one I've been reading quite a bit of, Hitch. Christopher Hitchens. I don't know Christopher Hitchens. Okay, you should look into him. I will. Great I will. debater. Okay. Just Google him. You love philosophy. Watch his debates. Mm. Um, and, okay, that's three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one category. That's one category. Good. Next interview, we'll do another category. Okay, all right, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. If you could not be a, a, a drummer, what would be your second profession? And, and I, I kind of tend to think it might not be piano player, although you're an exceptional piano player. Well, what do you think? Well, it could be piano player. That would mm -hmm. be a good choice. But right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow in the... Uh, uh, on from the previous question and say I'd love to, I always thought about being a writer. Mm. What a romantic, fantastical lifestyle that would be if you were a successful if, one. I was just going to say you want to talk about suffering for <laughs> art. <laughs> <laughs> Writing, I mean, you know, just disappearing for a year at a time to write a book somewhere in, on a deserted island or, uh, or an know, ice sheet in, in the outback. <laughs> oh, the outback, Christ, <laughs> of course. <laughs> writing books, mm. you know, but uh, but I guess I kind of fulfill that through my writing. I'm doing so much writing now for my own music, you know, right. my own projects, and it's, I can I get that feeling, you know. It's so nice to decide, you know, put a certain period of time aside mm. and be able to dedicate it to that ultimate creative pursuit, not only playing music but creating music. So when you're writing, you're writing mostly music. Are you writing any lyrics as well? I'm writing lyrics now too. Good. Okay. Yep. In fact, my new record, which is coming out, probably out by the time this interview is aired. Go check it out. 
It's yeah. called Ruination. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we'll be touring the US uh, all of September, October mm -hmm. 2019. And um, that record uh, has four vocal tracks on it, and, as and well wrote, as the instrumental. You wrote the vocal tracks. I, I mean, wrote, wrote the, the vocal the, the, tracks. The lyrics, sorry. My new band, Icefish, yep. which has a debut record out, is all vocal. It's progressive rock vocal. And I wrote and co-wrote some of the lyrics. Excellent. Uh, so I'm getting, uh, I'm getting to exercise my love of words and literature. Excellent. Congratulations. Not doing it so well, but... Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? Because you're going to be your worst critic, right? Yeah, I know. You're I know. <laughs> Uh, what was the strangest venue in which you ever played, and why? You know, when you say that, the, f the first image that comes to mind mm. is the Eiffel Tower. You played, in, played on the not, second level? No, not in the Eiffel Tower, but oh. in front of. Oh, okay. It was a huge Bastille Day concert, oh. 1.2 million people. <laughs> so I would say that's strange. Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not normal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, something that you would never do again that you did. Oh, God. And don't worry about statute of limitations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. I would, let's see, something I did and would never do again. Oh, it's pretty banal. I'd have to say skiing. You'd never do it again? Yeah, I just don't have... The time or the inclination for it, you know. Yeah. I like snow. I, I, I don't mind tobogganing, but, but skiing, it was, a, I, I tried it and I went too steep too quickly and oh. I just lost control. And it felt like when I get on stage and play a drum solo. And, <laughs> but there's no drums in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> it was scary. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just thought, you know what, you've got to make choices in life. It's just, you can only do so many things, so mm. I'll eliminate that. That's a good idea, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you could take you know, red pill, blue pill, and be able to pick up any rhythm right now and just, it's learned, which one would you pick? Oh, a rhythm? Any, any type of rhythm, yep. I don't know, I can play them all. Well. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> well, I've devoted my life to playing rhythm, so I, I, I guess I can claim to get pretty close to it. But I'd have to say... How about perfect? Which no, 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 no. I'd, I'd have to say Brazilian rhythms, okay. not a rhythm, but Brazilian rhythms in general. Right. I, I just love that, that, that sound, that the way they... The powering of the rhythms, mm. the, you know, the... the um, that natural sense of the feel that you can only have if you play Brazilian music with Brazilians yeah. for um, probably in Brazil. Uh, it's just wonderful music. And mm. uh, even though I have, you know, dabbled in Brazilian music and rhythms, you know, it's something you have to live. So I'll, I'll say Brazil, Brazilian rhythms. Excellent. I've got some Brazilian people I want to introduce you to. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Virgil, we have made it through Drummer's High. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And really, your philosophy, your, your thought, everything else, it, along with your fantastic playing. From, for everybody, I say thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, Virgil Donati, this was Drummer's High.